Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of you, depending on where you may be. My name is Sophia Arend, and I'm the Global Blockchain Business Council's Communications and Content Lead. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to the GBBC's Virtual Members Forum. This is a bi-weekly webinar we host showcasing the innovative work of our members around the world. And today we have the pleasure to be joined by Marta Belcher, board chair at the Filecoin Foundation and at the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. She'll be presenting on how Filecoin and the Filecoin Foundation are building the incentive layer of the Decentralized Web. We'll also have a live Q&A afterwards. Uh, just briefly before we begin, I'd like to introduce Marta. As I mentioned, she is the board chair of these two organizations, and she is also an attorney at Ropes and Gray and a leader in the area of blockchain law. She serves as an outside general counsel for Protocol Labs and a special counsel to the Electronic Fa Frontier Foundation, and also works with the Blockchain Association and other companies, industry associations, civil liberty orgs in matters related to blockchain and public policy. She has been recognized twice by the Financial Times Innovative Lawyer Awards and was named to Law 360's list of rising stars in fintech. She has spoken about blockchain law around the world, including testifying in the New York Senate and speaking in US Congress, European Parliament, the OECD, and in Davos during the World Economic Forum. Marta has drafted amicus briefs in the US Supreme Court and US appellate courts for high profile public interest organizations, including the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the Center for Democracy and Technology, Public Knowledge, the Cato Institute, and the National Consumers League, as well as Project Gutenberg and the Blockchain Association. We're so pleased to have Marta here with us today to share a little bit more about the Filecoin Foundation, and we welcome your questions at any point during today's webinar, and we'll take them at the end. So without further ado, let me hand things off to Marta to kick us off. Thank you so much for that introduction, Sophia. I'm so excited to be here to talk about the Filecoin Foundation and the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. I want to start by telling you a story about a small mix up a long time ago that made me start thinking seriously about what it means for the internet to be centralized. Uh, so there's an ebook competitor uh, to Kindle that is called Nook. And back in 2012, people were reading War and Peace and they noticed some irregularities. Throughout the book, the word Kindle had been replaced with the word Nook. So imagine you're reading War and Peace and you see that someone nooked the fire. So clearly what had happened here is someone uploading this to find and replace to replace the word Kindle with the word nook, like on the title page. And they inadvertently replaced it throughout the entire book. And at the time it was funny, but it was also disquieting because in 2012, it made me think about what it means to experience so much of our lives through a handful of large corporations and to have no choice but to trust those corporations, to trust that the copy of War and Peace they serve you as the original, to trust those companies not to misuse troves of data about us, what we do online, who we talk to, what we click on, what we say, and to trust them to keep that data safe from attackers and to protect our civil liberties when responding to requests from governments. This was a small incident a long time ago, but it was the first time I thought about what it means for those corporations to be fallible. Now, this was in 2012. <laughs> Since then, so much has happened. The Snowden disclosures, Cambridge Analytica, the US presidential elections, and these issues have come to be at the center of public discourse. At this point, it's trite to say that the internet is controlled by a handful of corporations that control all of our data. And there are all sorts of proposals for addressing these concerns, many of which involve heavy regulation. But these proposals, in my view, uh, overlook the fact that the internet may not need to be centralized. Are these intermediaries really inevitable? Uh, and why is that? Why is it that our internet has to operate like this image on the left? Why is it that if I wanna send a file to someone sitting next to me, it has to be sent across the world and back before it gets to their device. Imagine a group of people who are together in a remote place. Maybe it's a quarantine pod, or maybe it's Mars. If they wanna to talk to each other over the internet, that data has to be sent across the world. And if that connection to the outside world is cut off, then they can't communicate with each other, even though they're all close together using devices with unfathomable computing power. Why can't they just be connected directly to each other? This centralized model also creates single points of failure. 
And that's particularly concerning when you think about the fact that file storage right now is basically a monopoly. So much of today's internet relies on just a few companies to store and serve billions of websites and applications. Roughly three quarters of cloud computing runs through just three companies, AWS, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud. We've seen AWS suffer blackouts and some of the most popular and important websites suddenly become unavailable. That's the problem with having a single node in the center. But if you decentralize the internet, multiple nodes can fail without the entire system falling apart. If you add up all the storage capacity and computing power on individual user devices, on your phones, our laptops, you start to wonder whether we really need our data to sit in data warehouses, mostly unused, when we might instead combine our storage and computing power into effectively a supercomputer network. On today's internet, if I go to a web page, that information is being retrieved from a particular server somewhere in the world, maybe very far away from me. I'm looking for that particular web page in a particular place and hoping that it's still in that place. So imagine for a second that you just read a great book in physical hard copy and you recommend it to a friend by saying it's at the New York Public Library on the second floor, third shelf from the left, five books over. That's how today's internet works. To get to that book, you're going to have to fly to New York, go to the public library and find the place where that book is supposed to be. But what if it's not there? What if someone moved it? Or what if you get there and you realize that it's a book that was in your backpack the whole time you were traveling there? What if someone tore out pages? Again, that is today's internet. It makes a lot more sense to just tell your friend the name of the great book to just read and uh, let your friend find that book by its name rather than its location. That's what IPFS does. Rather than retrieving content by where it is, it retrieves content by what it is. It uses content addressing. Content on the web is addressed directly using cryptographic hashes instead of by reference to a file located on a specific server. This means you don't need an exact web address to find your file. You just need to know its hash. And if you already have it or someone near you has it, you can retrieve it from there. And that's why it's called the interplanetary file system. Because if you are on Mars, you can retrieve files from other people on Mars rather than experiencing the delay of sending data back and forth from Earth. Uh, there's roughly a six minute communication delay between Mars and the Earth. And if you wanna be able to load websites, collaborate, post on the same forums, watch the same YouTube videos, that simply doesn't work. Today, of course, content is generated on Earth, but someday content will be generated on Mars or the moon or somewhere else. And we need an internet that bridges this divide. In the centralized model, you would have to wait six minutes for a message to load from Earth and then ask the person on the other end to wait another six minutes. And that just doesn't scale. For interplanetary communication, you need a model where anyone can give you the content you're looking for from a local network node. So if anyone Earth, on Earth has already grabbed the six minute delay from Mars, they can now serve that content on Earth. IPFS makes decentralization workable and scalable by putting power in the hands of end users instead of centralized platforms. And widespread adoption of IPFS could be a major upgrade to the web to protect free speech, resist surveillance, prevent network failure, and empower ordinary internet users. Okay, but why would people be motivated to run the infrastructure for a decentralized web. So right now on IPFS, if someone is serving the only copy of a file and they close their computer and go offline for a few days, that file isn't available for a few days while they're offline. So in order to make sure that data persists, you need to make sure that there are multiple copies or that someone is incentivized to always make it available. But if there's no central corporation for you to pay to host your website or store your data, who's going to host it? who's going to shoulder the cost of the massive amount of storage capacity and computing power it takes to run the web. Our answer is Filecoin. Filecoin is the incentive layer on top of decentralized storage networks like IPFS. Filecoin allows you to store files in a peer-to-peer -peer network with built-in economic incentives to ensure files are stored reliably over time. Some people call it Airbnb for file storage. People rent out their storage space and earn Filecoin for doing so and users spend Filecoin to store files. Think of it as a supercomputer network of hard drives working together to leverage unused storage capacity. 
It's a cryptocurrency power storage network designed to house humanity's most important information. And it's a potentially a foundational technology for the decentralized web. Here's how it works. Miners earn Filecoin by providing open hard drive space. Miners compete with each other on factors like reliability, price, and reputation. Users spend Filecoin to store their files encrypted in the decentralized network. Like Airbnb did with physical space, Filecoin offers those with extra hard drive space an economic incentive to share it, while offering those looking for extra storage space a faster and cheaper option than traditional cloud storage. It's an alternative to the big centralized cloud storage systems we're all familiar with today. As a result, with Filecoin, the internet becomes less dependent on centralized cloud storage providers. Users, not corporations, own their data and decide where and how to store it, move it, and retire it. And users' data is stored safely and reliably on local hard drives simply by putting idle storage capacity around the world to work. After years of work, the Filecoin mainnet went live in October 2020, and today it has almost three exabytes of storage. To put that in perspective, that's almost uh, uh, 3 billion gigabytes of data, enough to store 870 million movies, more than 13,000 copies of Wikipedia, and we're still just getting started. The creators of Filecoin envisioned an independent foundation that would serve as the long-term governance body for the Filecoin ecosystem. That was the genesis of the Filecoin Foundation. The mandate of the Filecoin Foundation is to grow an op open ecosystem for decentralized storage and to give developers an open and sustainable platform to build, enhance, and monetize and those services. Uh, it's an ambitious mission, and I want to tell you about our goals and strategy for accomplishing it. Our first goal is to build and support the Filecoin community. There are so many stakeholders in the Filecoin ecosystem, miners, developers, researchers, token holders, clients, users, we want to support them all. Miners are essential to the functioning of the Filecoin ecosystem. We want to understand miners' needs and collaborate closely with them. To that end, we're creating a miner working group to ensure a direct line of communication between the foundation and Filecoin miners. Developers are also a key part of the community. Filecoin is, of course, open source, and more than 1,000 developers have worked on more than 230 projects that are built on Filecoin. The foundation offers dev grants to inspire more contributors to solve unsolved problems. And we intend for these grants to stimulate engagement with the Filecoin project and to reward ongoing contributions that add value to the Filecoin network. The foundation is currently administering wave six dev grants that will total up to 350,000 USD. The foundation also engages with developers through hackathons and accelerators. We're also working to accelerate the growth of the Filecoin ecosystem through partnerships and collaborations. Filecoin has an impressive ecosystem of more than 100 organizations that are collaborating on the Filecoin network to build applications, developer tooling, infrastructure, and more. Here's an example of an app that in the ecosystem built on top of Filecoin called Slate. Slate is like Dropbox for Filecoin. It's an open source storage system for your data that makes it easy to collect, organize, and share them anywhere on the web. Another great use case is the Starling framework for data integrity. Starling authenticates and stores uh, very sensitive digital records such as testimony and documentation about human rights violations, war crimes, and genocide. It was also used to document election security in the 2020 US elections. For 78 days, teams at the Sterling Lab and Reuters worked together to document the presidential transition uh, to Joe Biden. These troves of data are stored in the Filecoin network using Filecoin and IPFS. And those are just a few examples of projects in the Filecoin ecosystem. As an open source project, it's also vital that the Filecoin uh, ecosystem has transparent community-driven governance. Uh, the foundation facilitates that governance process, including the Filecoin improvement proposals process, which we call FIPS. <clears throat> FIPS play a central role in how changes happen and are documented on Filecoin. The FIP process is the way any community member can propose changes to the Filecoin network, and the community can discuss network upgrades and adopt changes. FIPS act as the source of truth for the community. The FIP process is based on the Ethereum improvement proposals process, the Bitcoin improvement proposals process, and the Python enhancement proposals process. Other exciting projects under the helm of the foundation include the Bug Bounty Program, which rewards individuals who find and report vulnerabilities, the Emergency Response Program to respond quickly 
specifically to security incidents and Filecoin Plus, which maximizes the amount of useful storage on Filecoin by adding a layer of social trust to the network. The Filecoin Foundation has a sister charitable organization, the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. The mission of this foundation is to ensure the permanent preservation of humanity's most important information by stewarding the development of open source software and open protocols for decentralized data storage and retrieval networks. The Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web sees Filecoin as a foundational technology for the broader decentralized web ecosystem and seeks to support that entire decentralized web community. We are also dedicated to funding and the development of open source tools that will be the backbone of tomorrow's decentralized web. And that doesn't just mean supporting exciting new projects and features, it also means consistent funding for infrastructure upgrades and security on existing projects. And we're dedicated to education about the importance of the decentralized web and changing the conversation about modern technologies. We want people to understand how centralized intermediaries act as single points of failure and can undermine privacy and expression. We want people to understand how decentralized on the web can preserve humanity's most important information. Uh, the foundations are under the stewardship of an amazing uh, uh, set of boards and groups of advisors. I am so honored to serve as the chair of the board of both foundations. Other board members include Rainy Reitman on the board of the FFDW. Um, she's a digital rights activist. <clears throat> Brian Ballendorf, the executive director of Hyperledger, who sits on both boards. Marsha Hoffman, uh, an electronic privacy attorney who sits on the FF board and advises the FFDW. Uh, Sandra Rowe, the CEO of GBBC. Uh, Joe Lubin, the co-founder of Ethereum and uh, founder and CEO of Consensus. Uh, Daniel Bryan, an internet activist. Sheila Warren from the World Economic Forum. Wendy Hanamura and Brister Kale from the Internet Archive. Uh, Katie Biber from Anchorage and Brex. Alex Fierst, uh, the CEO of Memoration Labs. Kristen Smith, the executive director of the Blockchain Association, and Georgia Quinn, uh, the uh, general counsel of Anchorage and former general counsel of CoinList. Uh, we currently have a full-time staff of five, including Clara Sow, uh, Megan Kleiman, Philip Bonhart, uh, Liz Rabel, and Rachel Horn. Uh, and we're growing. <laughs> we're looking for product managers, startup operators, and developer e evangelists to join our team. Um, and we'll have more roles posted soon. So please, please get in touch. Um, and we hope you'll join us in our mission to upgrade the web. Um, so that's all for my, my uh, presentation, Sophia. Thanks, Marta. That was great. Um, we've had a number of questions come in. And so I think I'll have you take a look at the first one in case you're familiar with the project. But I think more broadly, could you talk a little bit about how different projects come under the Filecoin uh, kind of umbrella or ecosystem, what that integration looks like? Sure, absolutely. Um, so we have, uh, uh, as you saw on that slide, a wide variety of, of different um, partners. Um, so some of these are folks who uh, have applied for dev grants, um, which I mentioned the foundation uh, administers, and who are then building on top of file, building applications on top of um, uh, the Filecoin technology, and who are you know also potentially uh, solving unsolved problems. So um, often it'll come through dev grants, but there are also lots of partners who are sort of uh, large corporations um, who have either just built on top of Filecoin themselves, this is of course all open source, um, or who have partnered um, with the foundation or another organization in the ecosystem um, to, to work on uh, their particular applications. But um, if you are a, a person who is interested in uh, getting involved, uh, please just reach out to the foundation and, and there's, there's tons of ways to get involved. Or if you don't feel like talking to humans, um, just go to our GitHub and uh, you can just build, uh, you know, you can you can do this all without any human interaction as well. <laughs> That's the beauty of open source. Uh, absolutely, that's great. Um, I'll just go down the list and couple some of these questions. I think just generally people, folks have questions about kind of like taking part in Filecoin. Also, um, folk, you know, so, okay. So what is the process for joining Filecoin and uh, lending your extra storage space, I guess, so to become a miner in this ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, folks, there, our miners have come, there's a wide array of um, miners. This, this ranges from literally just individuals who are just running the software on their, their individual computers to, you know, bigger mining operations where they're, you know, running 
where you have entire corporations that are just dedicated to Filecoin mining. Um, and so if you're an individual, you can just run our software. Um, you, you know, you don't, it doesn't need to be uh, a massive operation, but, but it definitely, it definitely ranges. We have folks on either end of the spectrum. And at, and at this point in time, are most Filecoin users individuals, companies, and could you, for example, uh, you know, is this, is this also built for big corporates or enterprises? Yeah. Um, so there, there are a number of um, there are a number of applications that are built on top of um, Filecoin that make it easy for individuals to interact with the Filecoin network. So, for example, I um, had showed a slide about Slate, which just makes it a really quick and easy interface if you're an individual and you want to basically use Filecoin. Um, but but effectively use something like Dropbox that's built on the Filecoin network. You can go to Slate and store your files on the Filecoin network, and it won't necessarily feel any different than using any other you know Web two product. Um, so individuals have have that ability, um, and then there are a variety of different um, you know companies that are um, that are uh, also building on top of uh, on top of Filecoin. Thank you. Um, I'm personally not familiar with this, but somebody's asked, um, what's the, what are the differences between IPFS and say Skynet by SIA or maybe other companies out there doing some, doing something similar? Um, so that's, that's a great question. Um, like what, what is the difference between these things? Well, I think that the, the hallmark, um, there, there may, may be more to this, but I think that the hallmark of IPFS really is the, the content addressing. Um, the idea that you are doing, um, you are addressing all content based on just a hash of what the content is, rather than in any way relying on the location of that content, um, such that, you know, if you are looking for a piece of content, you are, you, you know, sort of tell the network you're looking for this piece of content, and then it will get served to you. It can get served to you by the person sitting next to you or, who, you know, whoever is the most efficient the, the most efficient sort of use. Mm -hmm. um, like a really good example of this, for example, is like this happens in schools all the time. So like schools have terrible internet, right? And, um, or often have terrible internet. And everyone is trying to get to the same content, the same like YouTube video that's like needed for this particular lesson, right? And so it's sort of silly that like all 30 computers are going and like going out to uh, uh, the right, you know, go, go trying to get the same content from, um, from a centralized server that's really far away when you could just get it into the school once and then pass it around to everyone. Um, and I think there are other projects that, um, that do similar things, but I would say that the hallmark of, of IPFS in particular would be, um, would be the content addressing piece. And, and, and with that, do you find, you know, with the, with the folks that you've surveyed and with your community that for the most part, folks are maybe moving from like more traditional, cloud storage systems to the Filecoin and IPFS world due to cost reduction? Is it speed? Is it privacy? What are the, what are the primary drivers? So, you know, it's actually really interesting. There's, we have a, we have, um, there's an application built on top of Filecoin that sort of shows the, the you know, price per gigabyte stored. Um, and it turns out that like, well, you don't just, it, you don't just have to be interested in Filecoin for the, um, philosophical reasons or Web three, it turns out that the price is 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 extremely competitive because of the way um, we've set it up with economic incentives. Um, so the price for storage is you know price per gigabyte is is, is actually pretty pretty competitive. Um, and I think that you know in addition to that, um, it's the idea here really is that uh, for applications that are looking to be part of a decentralized web. Um, it makes a lot of sense to build on top of our platform as opposed to as opposed to others. So there are philosophical reasons too, but just on price and efficiency, I think there are plenty of good reasons to, to use us, even if you don't care if it's Web 2 or Web 3. That absolutely makes sense. I think, I think you find that in an, in an array of industries, folks switching to solar don't necessarily just switch because about for the environmental reasons. So yeah, definitely. I think, okay, so here's a question that um, comes, so, so from a US or global regulatory perspective, does cloud storage run into any regulatory challenges? And then maybe specifically you could speak to some of the regulatory considerations um, for the for Filecoin and IPFS. Yeah, totally. Um, so 
we actually have a really interesting approach um, that I'm, you know, as an attorney, really excited about um, to those types of content issues. Um, so I mentioned one of our advisors is uh, Alex Fierst. He's the former GC of Medium and the uh, current GC of Neuralink and um, a expert in content policy. And uh, he runs an organization called Murmuration Labs uh, that is basically the sort of content moderation shop for the decentralized web. So we actually take an approach to these sort of content moderation questions that allows for content moderation on a node by node level. So you can actually do uh, content moderation, but not through some sort of uh, centralized centralized host, but rather um, on a node by node level, you can sort of allow individual node operators to decide what types of easily decide what kinds of content um, they want to be storing and what kinds of content they don't want to be storing, um, you know, depending on their location or preferences and uh, enable them where murmuration is building the tools to enable them to make those decisions really quickly and easily. Um, so I'm also separately as an attorney, very excited about um, the really novel and fun and I think um, innovative approach to content moderation and to addressing those regulatory issues. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think I think a lot of folks would be definitely keen to learn more to, to learn more about that. So we can send around some some resources as well from from your website, which I'm sure they're hosted there. Um, somebody asked, so does Filecoin Foundation also work on clo on closing the digital gap? I think this is something that comes up a lot and whether you can speak to that sort of directly or indirectly within the foundation's mission. Yeah, so one of the things that I um, that I think is so cool about um, the way that the foundation is structured is that it's not just the Filecoin Foundation. There's the sister charitable organization, which is the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. And if you look at the mission statement of the FFDW, um, you'll see that it doesn't even mention Filecoin in the mission statement. It's really about the decentralized web generally um, and building the decentralized web. Um, and so um, there's there's so much um, extremely uh, uh, cool work that sort of, I think both can build on Filecoin and can just be part of this broader ecosystem that we are supporting. Um, for example, we recently um, have been supporting the work of uh, the Internet Archive and their amazing work in the decentralized web space. Um, and, um, and, and it's, you know, we're still growing and evolving in terms of what types of projects we're supporting um, and what our, um, you know, how our, our mission expands. So um, while we don't explicitly talk about like closing the digital divide, um, we definitely are all about um, building the decentralized web and we are not, a, we are not an organization that, um, be, because we have two organizations, um, we have the FFDW, which is an organization that, that doesn't just focus on Filecoin, it focuses on the entire decentralized web. Yeah, I think in in, in your presentation slides, you kind of broke that broke that down as well. So um, uh, somebody here asked, can you speak more about the documenting of the Trump Biden administration? Um, yeah, the Starling the Starling project. Um, so so uh, the Starling project is a fantastic uh, use case uh, for Filecoin and um, it's very very exciting. You know, whenever you have data that folks might have. Uh, incentives to want to disappear. Um, that is one of the places where Filecoin is so potentially useful. Um, we, you know, our mission is to store humanity's, uh, to preserve humanity's most important data. And so when you have this type of data, um, we, we get really excited about it being stored on our network. So for Starling in particular, um, they've done a variety of different projects. So one of them was just documenting um, with Reuters, the um, uh, the election and sort of showing, you know, show like creating videos that show that there is not, um, you know, election fraud happening, for example, um, and just storing it on the Filecoin network. And and the the Sterling Project also does things like um, recording testimonials from Holocaust survivors and storing those on the Filecoin network um, and other, you know, sort of uh, genocides and war crimes documentation and testimonials about that um, things that you know we really see as some of humanity's most important information that we think it's really important to um, preserve uh, you know and so that is why it is, uh, has been added to the the file ecosystem and we're, we're very excited to have that as part of our our mission 
That's an awesome project. Um, and for those of you that aren't familiar, we'll, we can also circulate a link to that so you can learn a little bit more. Um, just, I think a little bit jumping around here, but um, going back to some of the, the regulatory stuff you discussed earlier, somebody asked, are, are, are Filecoin users indemnified for the content that they host? Um, so the way it works, actually, um, I think if you're if you're thinking about um, Filecoin miners in particular, um, so as I mentioned, we have this um, content policy, um, uh, this set of content policy tools for murmuration labs, and the the sort of the the vision is instead of you know the way content moderation works right now, um, there are different laws. You know, obviously, right now there's a really big conversation happening about Section 230 and like a larger conversation beyond the decentralized web, just about you know about the centralized web and about under what circumstances um, uh, folks who are hosting content are are liable for that content. And so that's definitely a broader conversation. Um, but the thing that we were trying to address is okay, how how do you how do you do content moderation? You know, how do you make sure that you don't have, um, you know, bad content, um, but not have a centralized authority that is the one that is actually making those decisions, right? Because there are all sorts of examples of why that, you know, that doesn't necessarily scale, first of all, and second of all, why, um, you know, that's different. It's different around, it's different around the world. It's different for, for depending on different provinces. Um, so the idea is that if you are a, uh, a node operator or if you are, um, we basically enable, uh, our Murmuration Labs in particular is building these tools that enable content moderation decisions to be made in a decentralized fashion, i.e., you know, on a node by node level, decisions can be made about what content is being stored. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, node operators are, you know, uh, uh, looking at individual content, rather, um, we're creating things like um, lists. So we're working with, there are already a bunch of um, organizations that exist out there that will take, um, that cr literally just create lists of bad bets. Like there's, um, you know, there are organizations that, that have a list of content um, that, you know, is terrorist content, right? And that's that's all they do. And they work with all these major intermediaries to make sure that, you know, check that that content isn't on their platforms. Mm -hmm. And so we're working with those organizations to basically turn, you know, as I mentioned with IPFS, you can do uh, content hashing. So to make sure that the hashes of all those, all the known bad content um, is, uh, can be easily blocked uh, on the network and also creating ways that we can create you know, sort of bad bits lists um, that folks can basically, node operators can subscribe to depending on, for example, um, their location. Um, so it's a really unique, innovative approach to content moderation at a uh, decentralized, uh, in a decentralized fashion. And um, we're really, really excited to be supporting uh, Murmuration Labs in building those tools. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. You mentioned this um, in your presentation as well about some of the education that the foundation is doing. Can you speak to some of the specific initiatives that are out there and available to folks to learn more about the decentralized web and some of these new models and mechanisms that you're that you're describing that might not be so familiar to to, to many people who have you know you know are just we're all familiar with the centralized model more so and that. This is a very new idea. So how, how do you get, how does Filecoin go about getting the word out about these things? Yeah, so we have, I mean, an absolutely incredible, as you saw, um, group of advisors um, that really enables us to um, uh, coalition build and and work on on issues and and that includes education you know across orgs um, which has been which has been phenomenal and which I'm really excited about um, moving forward. Um, we also, uh, we also, frankly, uh, don't need to reinvent. There are certain things that we're really excited to invent and create. And also, there are plenty of things that already exist that we don't feel like we need to reinvent that we just are really excited to support. So for example, in the edu in the decentralized web education space, there really has been no better organization um, than the Internet Archive, you know, really out there um, um, building community in the decentralized web. And so we've been really excited to get to uh, support the Internet Archive and and their work, uh, for example. Um, so so lo lots to do and and lots of possibilities and um, and and we're definitely growing and excited about the future and excited both 
to build our own and do our own work and also to support the work of others. Great, and just, uh, I just wanna make sure I get through a few more of these questions that folks asked. Um, somebody said, asked, what is the consensus mechanism for Filecoin and is it energy intensive? Yeah, so it is not, so yes, so a lot of, a lot of folks um, hear about the uh, energy use of, of Bitcoin, uh, uh, you know, as being effectively the same as, you know, a, a country, um, and that is proof of work. Um, Filecoin is not proof of work, uh, it is uh, proof of space time. And so uh, it is not, it is not as energy intensive as, um, it is not as energy intensive as, as the Bitcoin network, um, which, which is, which is fortunate. <laughs> Certainly, I think that's, I think that question comes up a lot about this energy intensiveness and sort of the consensus mechanism answered, that that, that, that answered your question. I think just before we wrap up here, um, you know, something that we do like to ask at the end is what's on the horizon, both for, both for, for file, the Filecoin Foundation and for the decentralized web? Uh, you know, what does 2021 have in store for you all and then in, in, in the future and beyond? Well, um, you know, I think for, for the foundation specifically, um, we are growing like crazy um, as an organization. Um, we have an amazing, amazing full-time staff of five right now, um, but we are hiring at this very moment for uh, six different roles. And um, we are also uh, probably going to end up hiring for, for, I think, a lot more roles. So um, really growing, we're really a growing organization. Um, we're and we're excited about uh, you know we're excited about the growth. Um, we also are really excited about um, the the dev grants um, that we're doing um, and other other grants we're working on and, and partnerships we're doing. So I am really excited for 2021 at the foundation. Um, and I think for the decentralized web generally, you know, it's interesting. Like this, we're definitely in a, a you know, 2017 esque moment with regards to cryptocurrency generally. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in some sense, I personally like, I sort of liked, you know, there's like, it's sort of, there, there are these, there are these, you know, there's sort of like was the quiet uh, in the, in the well post 2017 period when everyone's sort of just building and everyone who's in the cryptocurrency space or really people who are, you know, really into the cryptocurrency space. But on the other hand, it's really nice to be back in a moment where the, cryptocurrency and these types of technologies are in the international uh, uh, spotlight where we have news cycles and where we have the attention of the broader uh, of the broader uh, you know public and I think that it's a great moment to uh, evangelize about the possibilities of the decentralized web particularly on the backdrop of uh, a lot of broader conversations about these larger centralized, uh, technology companies and the implications um, that come from those technology companies uh, having so much control over our lives. So I think a lot of great things on the horizon for 2021. It certainly sounds that way, and I think I think that I think that might have been your call to action for the community. But um, let, let me just ask: you know, what can the blockchain and technology community do now to get the word out about the decentralized web and kind of? what are, well, what can the community do one? And then what do you view as like the next, the big hurdle to adoption and this really taking off, you know, as much as it is already, if there are. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, a couple of our advisors um, like to like to say that, you know, blockchain technology, for example, will have, will have taken off when no one talks about it anymore. <laughs> you know, when it's like, um, when it's like TCP IP or something where it's sort of like, no one ever talks about it, but it's sort of part of um, part of our everyday lives. And you know, it's interesting. We were talking about Filecoin like earlier with one of the questions. We were talking about you know how folks interact with the Filecoin network. And when you're interacting with applications built on top of Filecoin, um, like Slate, for example, it really doesn't feel um, very different than um, than than the other uh, the other applications you're interacting with um, on a day to day basis. And so um, I think. Um, I think continuing to to build applications and uh, uh, on top of a these sort of like decentralized web infrastructure uh, and and to work on the decentralized uh, the, the technology that really is serving as the foundational technology um, of the decentralized web um, rather than working on web two applications or web two technology I think is what um, folks in the community can really do to make this 
become mainstream. Absolutely. That makes, that makes perfect sense. And it goes back to that idea that, you know, very few people actually know how email works, myself included, but we use it every day. Um, right. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Marta, for taking the time. Um, if you have any final words, I'll, I'll cede the stage over to you all. But I know people are asking about slides and recording. Um, a recording of this will be shared with all of you um, and will also be posted to GBBC's YouTube channel. Um, uh, thank you all so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. And um, our next uh, our next episode of the GBBC Virtual Members Forum will be with the Stellar Development Foundation. So we'll send around the information for that as well. Marta, any final words for our audience? Just thank you. Thank you so much for being here. We're so excited and um, please, please get in touch. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Marta. And thank you to all of you who dialed in today and for your insightful questions. We will share uh, more information about Filecoin um, as well as uh, the recording of this webinar. Thank you and take care.